Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the Eastern Border. This is the last episode at home that I record from my current microphone, which is a Zoom. I'm switching to American. I managed to get a good price for a Shure microphone, which is based upon the legendary uh, SM7B. It's just that it's modified for podcast use by uh, Shure. So, you know, moving up, moving up somehow. However, that's not the main topic of this episode, but I have a new mic, which is great, thanks to all of you guys who support me. I also managed to have to destroy my phone and maybe this phone. The problem here being that, um, yeah, I was starting to take all of this more relaxed since I returned from Ukraine, and that proved out to be wrong. Yesterday, as I was giving my speech in local pub about the whole trip to Ukraine, I noticed that my phone was being hacked. Random messages, calls from everywhere, login attempts at every application from all, all over the world, everything of that sort. What turned out to have, have happened is that Victor, the German camera guy that you know by now, well, his phone was hacked with other symptoms, but most likely they found out our numbers from there, and then they started hacking my phone. So I had to destroy my Blackview and uh, Evita's Samsung. Now, thankfully, I bought a new Samsung for Evita, and uh, people on PayPal gave me enough money to buy a new phone for me, by Blackview again, which is coming from China. However, I still have a massive budget hole because of that in my family thing, since I had to buy the replacement on Frevita and we lost a bunch of money. Very sad. So if you, I'll just put this in here, if you like to support the show, become our patron on patreon.com slash the eastern border, or go to the eastern border LV and click the donate button over there. Yeah, that would be really nice, because... Yeah, like I said, I had forgotten the fact that I am a high priority target after all. And especially after I reported from Ukraine and shown, you know, Ender Godar and all these other things uh, on, on the message. Pretty sad, really. I like my old phone. I don't buy all those Apple nonsense things. The phone I got for myself is Blackview BV9300, BV basically. A good phone, huge battery, nice camera, specs inside, not so much, but what matters is it's a ruggedized phone. But yeah, if you want to help, please click the donate button or become a patron. It would be really nice of you, otherwise it wouldn't be here. But yeah, turns out that I can be hacked easily. Turns out that if you're not careful with your phones, those privacy things start to matter. However, we also have more things besides that for the whole newest thing. What has happened is that, for one, Ukrainian authorities say that Kadyrovites, the Kadyrovtsi, the Chechen guys who are usually at Zagreb Trad, that they are, you know, have been committing some crimes. See, in the Mariupol city, their council, in Mariupol, by the way, is where Azovstal was located, they report that a shootout took place in the village of Urzov, which Russia has annexed, obviously. And that's in Mariupol, the district of Ukraine's Donetsk region. And this happened between soldiers from Chechnya and representatives from the local quote-unquote commander's office. According to the Mariupol authorities, the Urzuf shootout, which occurred on August 11th, killed at least four Russian soldiers. There were also deaths and injuries among the civilian population. The city council posted video footage of the apparent aftermath of the shootout on its telegram channel. An advisor to Pyotr Andrushenko, the mayor of Mariupol, said that Quote, by one account, the K- Kadyrovite got drunk and shot civilians and soldiers. End quote. He says that Chechen security forces were allowed to take leave in Urzov. After the shootout, entry and exit from the city were prohibited. On the morning of August the 13th, the major's advisor reported that seven civilians had been killed in Urzov. Major Andrushenko said that two teenage girls, four men and one woman, were among the dead. He initially said that three civilians were wounded. Other independent sources have not confirmed reports of a shootout in there, but I've heard them from many sources either way. Though Ivan Tupsov, the Russian-appointed head of the annexed village, told Telegram channel Astra that a shootout did in fact occur there. He also said there were victims, but you know, that just makes sense. Tupsov did not know who took part in the shootout and suggested it was Russian soldiers. Ahmed Dudayev, Chechnya's minister for national politics, called the Ukrainian authorities' reports fake and deep fabrications. Which means they're true, because if Russia hardcorely denies something, then it must exist. Also in the news is the fact that 
A new limited liability company with the name Wagner Group has been registered as a as a as an organization in the Belarusian Unified State Register of Legal Entities. This is what the Telegram channel Rotonde reported. They are noted to have been, you know, put in the whole sphere of their business as educational organization. The independent Belarusian outlet Zerkalo noted that the organization was registered on August the 4th in the country's Asipovtsi district and that its address in the village of Tsiel, where Wagner mercenaries set up a training camp in the days after Yevgeny Prigozhin's aborted rebellion. And yeah, still, <laughs> according to Belarusian state records, the newly registered organization will be engaged solely in educational activities, which is obviously, well, pretty much bullshit. Further on, there, have been, there has been a breakthrough from things on front. Ukraine's deputy minister, Hama Mahilar, Malyar, sorry, has announced that the Ukrainian army has liberated the village of Urozhainia in the Donetsk region. Quote, our defenders are fortifying their new positions. The offensive is continuing, which he wrote on Telegram. On August the 14th, Malyar had reported that the Ukrainian offensive had made some progress in the area. The Russian pro-war telegram channel Rybar, which I highly recommend you follow, by the way, follow a, a wrote that following the Russian military's retreat from, from Urzhainia, the village was in the grey zone. While reportedly fully in control in the north of the village, the Ukrainian units were under artillery and art- an aerial fire in the south. By morning of August 15th, the Russian battalion Vostok admitted having lost its po- pro- positions in Urzhainia. In an emotional telegram post, the writer expressed shock at the ferocity of the battle that went on there. The Ukrainian military started its assault on the fortified Russian positions at Urzhainia at August 8th. Shortly afterwards, the New York Times predicted that if forced to retreat from the area, the Russian military would have to move its positions from the second line of defense further south, which they're not really doing because of political reasons, in the direction of Storominica. The Ukrainian army would have then found itself only 80 kilometers or 15 miles away from Bredyansk and Mariupol, which is on the Azov Sea coast, obviously. But uh, that's about the front lines and all the serious news. However, I haven't mentioned meanwhile Russian news for a while, which I get from Telegram channels. So here's some of them, which are like I found extra funding these past days. See, in the Stavropol territory, one convict who had been sent to serve in Wagner Group and then to the regular army of Russia returned home and killed a pensioner doing a robbery which Vaza reports, I'm just mentioning it here because not another day without the exploits of so-called heroes. Vladimir Putin is supposed to hold a meeting on currency control after the ruble depreciation. And the locals on the Telegram channels report that, quote, if earlier there was hope that we would not see the dollar at 150 rubles very soon, now there are no options at all. The milestone will be taken in the very near future. Firm and clear. Have to agree with them. And more from the regional news. Comrade Major pleases right from the morning today. Quote, The Ministry of Internal Affairs decided not to waste time on trifles and developed a bill abolishing the secrecy of correspondence. If the law is adopted, then why not, then any communication on the internet and information about connections can become an object for an operational search activities and will be tracked remotely through cloud storage, data centers and etc. in real time. A court decision, in Russia obviously, for such a scanning of citizens can be obtained after the interested parties know everything about you. And, uh, well, um, the presumption of innocence is also, of course, immediately demolished. So that, you know, they wouldn't have to get up twice for the voting booths. Also in the news, honored economist of Russia, Tatyana Yagirina, was scammed by banking fraudsters for 1.4 million rubles. That's about... 13,617 euros, or about $14,000, which is a lot, especially knowing that she's an economist. See, Tatiana Yagirina received a phone call from unknown people, that's from the article, who introduced themselves as the security service and recommended that the money may be urgently transferred to a safe account in order to save it. Previously, Yagirina was a member of the State Commission of the Council of Ministers of the RSFSR on the Economic Reform. And started, started the same Duma, by the way, from Yabloko from 1994 to 2003. In 2010, she was awarded the honorary title of Honored Economist of the Russian Federation. Obviously, 
At this point, there are no more questions why the economy of the USSR and the Russian Federation happened. Because, you know, these guys are running the whole thing. Another thing is that in Kazan, meanwhile, a guy, a person, came to his mother's court seeings and hearings and received seven days of arrest there because of a tattoo on his neck where apparently the coat of arms of the Third Reich was portrayed. Buzz also reports. This just shows that family values, you know, they never die. And the Vtsyom, which is a long abbreviation that I'm going to translate here, continues the Festival of Amazing Stories. Today, we found out that almost half of Russians under the age of 24 do not rule out looking for work in the north of the Russian Federation, which is the mines and everything. The comments from Telegram go like this, quote, Soon we will learn that half of the country dreams of exchanging their gadgets and iPhones for a pickaxe, and in the life of young Russians there is no point more than cutting down the forest and feeding midges from dawn to dusk. Because obviously. That's all weird and all, but I have uh, something cool for you. If you'll join the Discord channel, which I'll post the link to in the show notes, and it's been ma- massive amounts of show notes anyways, because I'm no longer in Twitter... What I want to show you is a video, video that's going to be there in this court, because apparently the final news that I saved for today from Meanwhile in Russia section is the fact that um, the exhibition Army 2023 presented a inflatable military field temple. You're not getting me wrong, that's what happened. Equipped with a dry closet and an image of Christ with the letters Z and V, where, you know, the traditional letters of, you know, being the king of Christians or king of the Jews or whatever will be, will be found out about. It's inflatable, it's great, and, uh, well, I hope the temple can really do its job. Otherwise, it's just so silly that it's kind of hard to imagine that it would actually function as anything more but a stupid propaganda piece. However, you know, we're not surprised about propaganda pieces at these parts. What I also want to give you is a letter, again, from my buddy and mentor, Alexander Nevzorov, the Russian journalist, which you probably haven't heard of in Russian, but, you know, I try to keep this thing alive. Quote, in Soviet Union, it was, it was presumed that everyone needs to do, do and pass the GTO, ready for labor and defense. My dad passed it, mom passed it, everyone. Basically, you had to pass a physical exam, run things and everything. He writes, by the way, further on, that um, under Putin's regime, there are probably NMIs, norms of minimal idiocy, that any official must pass in order to say in the vertical. The sane and adequate have no place in leadership of the Russian Federation. As we can see, Narishkin, head of the Foreign Intelligence Service, passed the NMI successfully. He managed to demonstrate juicy, convincing idiocy. If Narishkin is pretending, he's a great artist. The old man deserves to end his days in Hagladen's prison amateur act. By the way, that's the prison where those convicted by the International Criminal Court are held, not far from the Hague. If Narishkin is sincere, and based on the testimony of his agents in the residency, then today his person, the whole Russian intelligence is based upon, has passed the test of idiocy. I read you the response first because um, the text is quite short that Narishkin said. And he said, and I quote, A person who is both physically and mentally capable must be in disgust and afraid to even visit Europe sometimes. To such a degree in Europe and in the Western world in general, such perversions are being like done every day that it must absolutely scare the people who live there and the travelers with normal mindset even more so. I mean, that is exactly true. Look at my show. I'm probably one of those perversions. I hope they truly listen to my show, because uh, that's just amazing. Like, again, these people, they do not care about what the serial situation is. They do not care about anything except their own wallets, and whether or not they'll stay in power. It's just that Everyone is going more and more stupid by the day. And the final thing I want to talk about today is the fact that um, Russian Human Rights Council chairman calls for amendments which require students who do not know Russian to study at language centers instead of ordinary schools. Valery Fadeyev, the chairman of Russia's Human Rights Council, said Wednesday, today, that children who don't know Russian should not be enrolled in ordinary schools and should instead study language at specialized centers. Because current Russian legislation does not allow schools to reject students based on their language ability, Fadeyev called for the law to be changed. Quote, 
The law should not allow students in schools when they don't know Russian and should require them to study Russian in specialized centers, he said. Fadeyev added that the education ministry is already working on the amendments to the law and that he believes the changes will be in place by the start of the fall 2024 school year. He called for the state to fund the proposed language centers, quote, imposing additional measures and additional costs on labor migrants is not entirely fair. The thing is, they don't do these things here. They demand the very things outside of the Russian Federation in every place they go. We had language, we had Russian language schools, we have, we have everything, but the people from the Baltics live in Russia, they have to learn Russian all the time. Double standards at, you know, for everyone to blatantly see. Getting a bit horrific, to be honest. Just, when Russia does this, it's fine. When someone else does this, it's uh, suddenly monstrous and fascist, like always. We're used to this at this point. Not like they're going to surprise us or anything. I'll call up my buddies in the front lines, because soon there's going to be another episode. I still have to do my articles. It's getting hard, you know, to focus and everything. But I'll manage. I'll manage. I hope so. But uh, that's about it for today. Sorry, the episode is shorter this time. It's just that I have been really, really busy. But if you want to support the show, please go to patreon.com slash the eastern border. Or, again, click the donate button on the eastern border to LV. Thank you for listening. Das Vidanya Tavarishi. And as always, remember, happiness is mandatory.